Hey, my friend, Mike Robertson here. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this webinar. We are gonna take a deep dive into the world of supersets. We're gonna talk about why you would use them, how to use them, and we're gonna give you some practical examples. And we're gonna cover everything from the basic physiological reasons that you might use a superset to some really fun, sexy neurological reasons that you might wanna use it to get the absolute most out of your training programs. And it doesn't matter whether the program's for yourself, your clients, your athletes. I think if you understand how to use supersets, it can not only give you a massive bang for your buck with regards to the outcomes of your movements and your lifts, but it can save you a massive amount of time as well. So let's go ahead and jump in. And before we do, in the words of Jay-Z, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're far too kind. Thank you for taking the time to watch this webinar. I realize we've all got a ton of stuff going on, right? The age of distraction is so real. So for you to take, you know, whatever it ends up being, 35, 45 minutes, maybe even close to an hour, to really understand all the various reasons that we would use supersets, it means a lot to me. And ultimately, I hope it means a lot to you. And it's gonna give you the ability to write a better training program as a result. So a little bit about me. Some of you that watch this may have been with me from the early days, 2003, when I started writing for T Nation. Others of you may be very new to my work. So I wanna give you a little insight as to who I am. Uh, I have been in every nook and cranny of the fitness industry. I've worked in rehab. I've worked in one-on-one. -on -one, I've done small group. I've done large group. I've worked with high school kids. I've worked with college division one athletes. I've worked with pros. I mean, basically you name it and I have done it at some point in time. And I think that gives me a unique perspective because I've seen people of all shapes and sizes, varying ability levels. And it's given me this understanding as to how people move. And it's also given me a certain level of empathy as to you know what makes people tick and how do you motivate people? Maybe it's with their programming or with the way you communicate with them, but it's allowed me to have, you know, uh, certain level of success that I'm very proud of. And here you'll see just a brief uh, listing of some of the important or famous people that I've worked with over the years. We got Roy Hibbert from when he played with the Pacers, Chad Marshall, if you're not a soccer fan, he was three-time, the only three-time MLS Defender of the Year. Lori Lindsay, uh, multi-time U.S. Women's National Team athlete. I worked with the Indy 11, which is our local soccer club here in Indianapolis for five years. Dwayne Allen played for the Colts. Our gym, IFAST, was named one of the top 10 gyms in America five, six, maybe seven times by Men's Health Magazine. So very proud of the accomplishments that we've accrued over the years. And I feel like I've earned my stripes as a coach because when I started out, I was a really bad coach. I was a really pro bad program designer. And over the years, just this constant evolution, this constant chipping away, and this constant curiosity has allowed me to see you know, what others would appear to say is a high level of success. I'm still always trying to, to chase and get better, but that's a little bit about me. And the next question becomes, why do I do this? Why do I do continuing education? Because I love coaching. I mean, if I could make the, the income that I wanted just coaching 24 seven, that's what I would probably do. Um, but in that same respect, maybe not, because I think of my life as, as especially my career as two different areas. I've got my coaching where I'm working with people one-on-one -on -one in the gym or in a small group and we're grinding and we're getting better. But I also feel like part of, of my career path is to educate other trainers and other strength coaches and help them better understand, hey, what tools do I have at my disposal? How do I continue to coach better, to cue better, to write better programs? So that's why I still create a ton of content on my website, whether it's my podcast, whether it's my videos, that's why I still go out and speak, not as much as I used to because I've got a small family now and that takes a big chunk of my time, but it's why I continue to speak. It's also why I created my complete coach certification because I am passionate about helping other fitness professionals get the absolute most, not only out of their clients and athletes, but out of their own careers. And it really makes me upset when I see the turnover rate when I see young coaches and trainers get burned out or quit our industry because they have so much energy and passion and enthusiasm early on, but ultimately that kind of falls by the wayside because they're not getting the results. And we all know if you don't get results, you're not gonna get paid. So that's why I created the Complete Coach Certification to help you get better results and therefore stay in the industry longer, make more money and make a real career out of this. 
So enough about me, let's talk about supersets. And I'm gonna start with a really basic question. Why do we use supersets in our programming? If you use them, why do you use them? And this isn't meant to be an exhaustive list as to why you would use it. But you know, when we talk about why people use supersets, a lot of the things that you may respond with are reasons like, I wanna build more muscle, or I wanna help my clients build more muscle. I wanna shed more body fat. Uh, I wanna improve movement quality. I wanna help somebody get better hip extension. Or I wanna help them squat deeper without pain. Maybe it's if you work with athletes, you want to help them increase their strength or their force or their power output. But I think the one overarching theme that we can come back to time and again when it comes to putting supersets in our program, there's one really big reason that we do it. It's very simple. It saves time. We all know we've only got a certain amount of time with our clients. If you're working in a gym setting, maybe you have 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 60 minutes, you have a certain window of time. If you're with a high school athlete, a lot of times if you're in a high school strength and conditioning setting, you may only have 50 minutes. If you're in a division one setting, you have a set or limited amount of time that you want to spend with, or that you can spend with your athletes based on what the NCAA dictates. And when you work with pros, you are like the last thing on their list. <laughs> you know, it's sad to say, but they have practice and they have media and they have other commitments. So time is of the essence in our world. And you're not trying to shortchange things, but what you are trying to do is maximize the training effect that you get with your clients and athletes. And saving time via supersets is an awesome way to do that. So what I wanna cover here today are seven ways that you can use supersets. So just like that wasn't meant to be an exhaustive list as to the reasons you might use it, this isn't an exhaustive list as to the ways that you can use it. But I think some of these will be familiar to you, and I think others may be a little bit more foreign, but also things that you may wanna really consider using in your programming. So I've broken it down into two categories. Number one, we've got our basic reasons for using supersets, and these are more physiology driven. On the flip side, we have what I would describe as the sexier reasons that we might use supersets. And these may focus more on neurology, and it may focus a little bit more on movement or movement quality. All right, so the three that you've probably heard of and are familiar with, the old school upper lower superset, which you see a lot in fat loss programs, the targeted muscle superset, and we'll dive into all of these in more depth here in just a minute. And third are opposing muscle groups. So these three you're probably familiar with. Now these other four you may not be as familiar with, or maybe you've seen one, but probably not all of them. So number four would be when we inhibit a muscle to then facilitate or activate an opposing muscle group. Number five are what I describe as patterning supersets, where we're trying to pattern or rebuild specific movements. Six is potentiation which is a really high powered tool that if you train athletes or you train people who wanna get faster or more explosive or stronger in the gym, potentiation can work really well for you. And then the final one may not be a true superset, it may be more of a triset, but I'm gonna put it in here anyways because I think you'll wanna use it, is what I describe as layering supersets. And these are awesome if your goal is to help your, your athletes move better or improve their athletic movements, all right? So as we go through this, I've got kind of a set order that I wanna walk you guys through. So first, we're gonna start with the theory, right? Why do we use a specific superset? What is the rationale behind it? Second, I think this is really important. I don't wanna just talk theory. I'm gonna give you practical examples, all right? So you can take this stuff and you can start using it right now today when you write your next program. Last but not least, I've got some application and notes, things that I want you to consider or things that you should be cognizant of when it comes to using certain methods. Because look, every method has specific benefits and it probably has certain drawbacks. So these are just things that I've learned over the years that I think can make your life a lot easier. So let's jump in. Superset structure number one. This is what I would call our upper lower alternating supersets. So, the first question that we have to ask is, why would I use an upper lower 
alternating superset. And what most people would describe, and, and I'm gonna actually put both of these up because I think it's, it's helpful to get these at the same time. The first reason you would do, say, an upper body exercise paired with a lower body exercise is to increase central fatigue. So what do I mean by that? Well, people would say, oh, well, you know, if you do a set of bench and then you take a break and then you go do a lower body exercise, like you get a rest in between. And I never really jived with that answer because it's not entirely correct. What happens is if you go do, a, say, a set of chest uh, exercise, whatever, it's a bench press or a push up, and then you do, say, a squat, one muscle group gets to rest while the other is working. So centrally, right, like your heart, everything else, your lungs, those are all working all at the same time. Right? So even though you're alternating between upper and lower body exercises, centrally your body is still working. It's a systemic training effect. But what it does is it minimizes your local or your peripheral fatigue. So imagine you go in the gym and you do a heavy set of 10 on squats. Right, You're huffing, you're puffing, you know you've just done a heavy set. Maybe it's going to take you a minute, maybe two minutes, maybe two and a half minutes before your legs are ready to go again. So instead of doing those straight sets where it's squat, 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 and then you go into bench, 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 maybe you do a set of squats and then you take a minute, minute and a half. Now your legs are still fatigued, but your body systemically is, is okay and your upper body's fresh. Now you go do a set of bench press. All right, so you see how that works. So centrally you are, you're fatiguing the entire system as a whole, but from a local or a peripheral perspective, you're kind of reallocating and you're allowing one body part to rest a little bit longer than it normally would while you're taxing another muscle group. So here are some upper lower examples and I'm not going to dive too deeply into these because it's pretty straightforward. It could be a squat and a push-up. It could be a split squat in a row. But let's make it really simple. It's anything that has to do with the lower body paired with anything that has to do with the upper body. So you can't really screw this up here. If you pick an upper body exercise, you pair it with a lower body exercise, you're probably going to be okay. Again, you're chasing a central adaptation here while you're letting those local muscle groups have a little bit longer to recover in between sets. So some notes and application here, because again, these are mistakes that I've made over the years. They're mistakes you might make. Hopefully I'm gonna help you short circuit some of those. One thing you have to do is monitor the pace of the workout. So a lot of times when you're doing, say, this upper lower uh, superset, you're doing it to keep the heart rate up and to try and increase the density of the workout. A lot of times you're going to do this in a fat loss style program. So what you don't want to have happen is you're writing the workout and they're supposed to be working on 60 seconds rest. And all of a sudden that rest is becoming 90 seconds or two minutes in between sets because now you're losing some of the training effect that you're chasing, all right? So you've got to monitor the pace of the workout. Second, this is something that I've seen a lot of people make over the years, or a mistake I've seen a lot of people make over the years, you've got to watch the lower back. So a lot of times people would say, oh, I'm going to do a back workout. And so they're going to have deadlifts and they're going to do rows and chin-ups and all of these exercises, but sometimes one muscle group is going to fatigue really fast. And sometimes when you have somebody pair, say, a deadlift or a hinging variation with something like a bent over row, that can really put a lot of stress and a lot of strain on the lower back. So I'm very conscious of this, and it's rare that I'm going to put a deadlift, lower body exercise, and pair it with some sort of unsupported uh, rowing variation where they're going to have to hold or isometrically hold that position for a long period of time. It can just make some people's backs very cranky. Another thing that you need to watch out for is grip. So if you're doing, again, a deadlift is a great example here because you gotta grip that bar, you gotta hold on tight, and then you pair it with, say, a chinning variation, this can be problematic as well because now you gotta use that grip to hold on to the bar. So you have to just be conscious of these things and know that you know some supersets uh, just don't work as well together as others. Okay, so just a couple things to watch out for there. So there's our upper lower superset. Another type of superset that we can talk about is the targeted muscle. And in most cases, what you're gonna see is uh, a semblance where we go from a compound exercise 
to an isolated exercise where we're focusing, focusing on a specific muscle group. So why would we use targeted muscle supersets? Two reasons. Number one, to increase the time under tension or the mechanical load on a muscle. Or in the old school like bodybuilding realms, it's to increase hypertrophy and or maximize fatigue of a specific muscle group. So again, let's, let's start with some examples here because sometimes I think that makes it a little bit easier. So let's say we're a bodybuilder or we're somebody that wants to train more for aesthetic purposes. If you want to build a bigger chest, one way that you can do that, you can do a bench press, right? You do a big compound lift and then you superset it with a dumbbell or a cable fly. Another example could be if you want to isolate and focus on the triceps, you do like a closed grip bench press and then you superset or pair that with a tricep extension. A third example, and again, we're getting kind of bro here, but I'm just trying to give you really clean examples to make this make sense. You could do a squat, which obviously is a big bang compound lower body lift, and then blow up those quads with a leg extension. So as you guys can see, we're really trying to tax and focus our, our stress and our energy on specific muscle groups. And what you do is you get a lot of hormonal output, right? You stimulate a lot of fast twitch motor units when you're using those big bang exercises, and then you can really dial in and focus on the target muscle with whatever our second exercise is. So again, notes and application. Generally, you're gonna do this using a split routine of some sort. So it's rare you're doing a two or three time a week total body lift and doing a lot of target muscle supersets. Instead, you're generally gonna be doing like an upper lower split or maybe the old school kind of bodybuilder body part type split. So there's a couple ways you can set it up, but generally you're gonna be on some form of a split routine. Now, the great thing about this is that you can place these anywhere in your workout. You can start it off first thing when you're really fresh and rearing and ready to go. You can also do it more as like a burnout, like pump type session at the end. So there's not a lot of wrong ways to do it. All that I would ask you to think through is, you know, what's your rationale? If you're going to put it first, why are you putting it there? If you're going to put it at the end, why are you going to put it there? Now, one thing that's cool, and I highlighted mostly the compound isolation, you don't necessarily have to do it like that either. You can pair multiple isolation exercises for that target muscle group as well. So a great example would be if you go in the gym and you do like the, the old school like uh, fly series, right? So you do like bent over flies and then you stand up and then you do lateral flies and then you do front raises. You could go through something like that. You could do cable or chest flies from multiple positions. So you don't have to do it from compound to isolated, but I think that's probably gonna give you the most bang for your buck. When you get to some of this stuff, you really just, as I would describe it, putting the icing on the cake. One other thing that I think you should notice is, or be conscious of, is to watch the loading on the first exercise. Because what catches up to you, let's say you crush that first superset, right? So you're squatting and then doing a leg extension. You're crushing squats, you know, you do that leg extension, you come back to the squats, you gotta understand there's like a lot of accumulated fatigue when you start that second set or that third set or that fourth set. So you gotta be conscious and kind of monitor your loading on the first exercise. You're not gonna be able to go as heavy for as many sets as you are used to or you're accustomed to. So you gotta be conscious of that. Now, superset structure number three, opposing muscle groups. And after this, we're gonna dive into the sexier stuff. But I think this is, if nothing else, it's a good review. So why do you use opposing muscle group supersets? And again, it comes back to that understanding or that idea of if you're just doing a set of squats, taking a break, set of squats, break, set of squats, you can absolutely just crush, say, your quads. But you know, what ends up happening is you just kind of gassed out at the end and you don't have the energy to hit some of the opposing muscle groups quite as hard. So you go quads, hams, quads, hams, and you balance it out a little bit better. Now, some people would tell you that this helps increase the pump as well. Uh, is that the case? Probably how much carryover or benefit that really gives you as far as muscle development? I don't know. I think the, uh, 
the jury is still out on that. But it's not to say, hey, look, I've been in that situation where I'm just going to crush biceps and triceps before I go to the beach or before I go somewhere else. Like, I get it. So if you're going to do that, by all means, do that. So let me give you a couple examples here. When we talk about opposing muscle group examples, we could go up top. Big bang compound. We could go with a bench press, right? We could go with a chest supported row. Now, there's a whole another level to this, right? When we talk about like balancing muscle groups, I wouldn't say a bench press and a chest supported row are the best exercises to balance each other, right? In most cases, what I would do if if I'm if I'm creating a cleaner superset where I want to get scapular protraction and scapular retraction, I'd go with some sort of a push up in a chest supported row. But, you know, if we're just thinking pressing and pulling, a bench press and a chest supported row work fine. We want to be really like kind of bro and dialed in, leg extension, leg curl. We want to get as bro as it gets, triceps and biceps. People say we don't have fun at IFAST. <laughs> this is our boy Zach just crushing some arms in the gym. I made sure I got him on the gram that day because he was working hard. So. When we talk about opposing muscle groups and specific things we need to be conscious of, lots of ways you can do this. You can do it with compound, or you can do it with isolated exercise. You could do a squat in an RDL, you could do a bench press in a row, or you could do biceps, triceps. Doesn't matter, lots of ways you can set it up. Here's a pretty cool way thing to weigh, or, yeah, sorry. Here's a pretty cool way to think about this though it can be used to restore movement potentially as well, right? So coming back to our chest supported row and our push up, hey, you know, once we've just closed off that upper back and we've trained those rhomboids, what if we wanna restore motion with our push up? So that's one way we could think about it. If you're doing those opposing muscle groups or doing those opposing movements, it could help us restore movement. Now on the flip side of that, it might just hamper your movement overall, right? So you're kind of, locking yourself up back here and then you're trying to reach and you're making it that much harder. So you got to be really conscious of if your goal is movement quality, make sure you're getting full ranges of motion. Make sure you're getting full range of motion through the upper back, full range of motion through the upper back when you're reaching as well. But here's the biggest benefit. At the end of the day, when you're doing this kind of stuff, it saves time. You're going to get in the gym and out of the gym quicker as a result of programming like this. So even if there's not a ton of carryover as far as building more muscle, it's gonna get you in and out faster. And in most people's worlds, that is a huge game changer. All right, now here's where things get fun. Let's talk about inhibition to facilitation. And this is one of my absolute favorite supersets. I use it probably in two out of every three supersets in some form or fashion, if I can, in any given workout. So this one for me, guys, if you use nothing else, can make a massive impact on how your clients move and feel. So let's start with the basics. Why do we use inhibition to facilitation supersets? What is the benefit? And for me, these types of supersets improve movement quality, which you guys know I don't love that term, but for now, let's go with it. It improves movement quality and or it cements a more optimal position at a specific joint. So a lot of times what I see is people are doing foam rolling and they're doing resets and they're doing certain things to try and restore position. But what they don't do is work to cement that optimized position throughout the rest of the workout. Okay, so let me give you some examples here. When we're talking about inhibition to facilitation, super simple example, you're going to do a hip flexor stretch, right? Whatever hip flexor stretch you like, we're going to try and inhibit the hip flexors, and then we're going to go into a glute bridge. So we're going to try and activate or facilitate the hip extensors. Simple, right? You could do this at the start of a workout. You could do it at the end of the workout. Lots of ways you could set it up. Now, how can we make that cooler? Well, I could do this in my activation, but I could do this towards the end of my workout. So in most of my workouts, I start with my ones, 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, 3A, 3B. And 3A, 3B for me is, in a lot of cases, it's cementing motion, it's restoring motion, it's cleaning up stuff that I know this client or athlete needs. 
So 3A, 3B is an awesome place to throw in a half kneeling exercise. It could be a landmine press, it could be a chop, it could be a lift, it could be a cable press. Any half kneeling exercise that you like, shutting off the hip flexors, and then we're gonna pair that with a core or an abdominal exercise. So you remember the pelvis, right, has this tendency to get dumped forward, hip flexors are pulling down, so I'm gonna shut off those hip flexors, get my pelvis back up to a better position, and then I'm gonna use my abdominals to pick up the slack. They're gonna pull up on the front side. So now I'm creating this better balance top to bottom through my pelvis. I'm gonna create a better pelvic alignment. Another way that we can do this is we could do a half kneeling exercise. Uh, again, a landmine press, a cable press, a chop, a lift, and then we could pair it with a hinging progression. So now we're taking this concept where it's very low level, low load, and may work great as an activation exercise, or it may work great uh, early on in a workout or with a deconditioned client. Now we can take it and really supercharge it. So with your athletes, hey, let's bang out some, some half kneeling work and let's go in and pull some heavy weights. Get those hips extended, man. I tell you that can be really, really powerful. So when we break this down a little bit more, in general, when I use this the most, it's something that pairs inhibition of the hip flexors with activation or loading of the hip extensors. That's the best way to use it, in my opinion. Are there other ways that you can do it? Absolutely. In fact, here in a minute, I'm gonna show you a specific superset that I use. It looks sort of like patterning, but it would fit well in this section of the, uh, the inhibition to facilitation area as well. The great thing about this too, it can be used almost anywhere in the training session. I can use it early on to help you know, restore motion, cement motion. I can do it later to help prime my main lift. I can do it at the end to clean up and restore movement quality or movement capacity at the end of a session. So there's really no wrong way to do this. You just have to be able to rationalize, hey, why am I putting this here and what am I hoping to get out of using it? All right, now we're getting really fun. Patterning supersets. So when we talk about patterning supersets, and I'm sorry, I've had all these great pictures. I've got some really cool videos coming up. Here you just have boring old me doing a, a PVC reaching squat. <laughs> but why do you use patterning supersets? And I think of patterning supersets as uh, stops in my workout where I'm focusing on improving movement quality in a specific lift, exercise, or movement. So. In this case, I use a PVC squat to help me squat better. Now, let's give you some examples and then I'll show you some video demos that I think will help. So when we talk about patterning examples, generally the second exercise is what we're trying to clean up, right? So like a squatting variation, a hinging variation, uh, a lunge or split squat. So in this case, the PVC squat helps us feel our whole foot, it helps us drive air into our upper back so that when we go into a squat, it actually looks like a squat where we're sitting down versus having to sit back. Another example, oop, sorry, I got ahead of myself there, a wall tap hip hinge. So we've all had that client that really struggles to hinge. Either they wanna squat down or they wanna arch their back. So in this case, what I'll do, I'll give them a low level or non-loaded exercise, like a wall tap hip hinge. Just groove that hinging pattern, and then we're gonna go and we're gonna load it a little bit. Maybe we're gonna go unloaded, and then we're gonna load it a little bit with an RDL. Or if we're just trying to make sure that they actually hinge when they trap bar deadlift, we'll go wall tap hip hinge, so they get that sensation of feeling their feet, feeling their hamstrings, and then we're gonna take them over, and now we're gonna hinge, and make sure they can hit that same position when they start. Another exercise, half kneeling uh, variation. Get them comfortable in that position. Get them to understand, okay, hey, look, I'm trying to load this hip. I'm trying to keep my abdominals on. I'm gonna get a little stretch through that back thigh. And then re basically reprogram them to do those same things when they lunge or when they do a split squat. So here's a great example. And again, this variation could work as a patterning exercise it could also work as an inhibition to facilitation because what we're trying to do here, you see Taya is very strong, very explosive. 
Uh, as I'm recording this, she's like the leading scorer in her league in Greece. She's basically a boss. But part of what makes her a boss is she's very stiff on the backside. It makes her strong, makes her explosive, but it, it has this tendency to, one, inhibit her squat, and number two, it has the tendency to make her break down a little bit faster, right? Because there's a lot of stress on her Achilles, on her knees, on her lower back. So it's my job to teach her how to squat more effectively. So what we do, we give her this PVC squat. And you can see what I'm chasing here. I want balance through her foot. I want her knees coming forward. I want to get her to sit down. And most importantly, when she's sitting in this position, make sure this is muted. I want to make sure she's breathing into her back and her hips are underneath her. Over time, as she gets better at this, it's going to keep her, instead of having to sit back when she squats, she's going to be able to sit down when she squats. Now, when you see this next video, you may not be super impressed because, look, she still has to sit back. She's 6'3", she's very propulsive in nature, but like, this is pretty darn good for a girl her size. And keep in mind, this was something that took us months to get to, right? You're not going to be impressed with the load, but it's not the point for her. She knows how to be explosive and be strong. I need to teach her how to load her body better. So we pair these two exercises. We pattern the lift. So we open up the back, and then we try and keep the back open as we squat down. We're patterning the squat. So I hope that makes sense. So some thoughts as far as the application goes here. The biggest question that people would have is, you know, which exercise do you do you do first? So let's call this our patterning exercise, and this would be our loading exercise. Which one do we do first? And here's what I would say. You would use the patterning exercise first if you want to groove a movement pattern. So Taya struggles to squat, so we always do her patterning exercise first. Open things up, and then we teach her via loading how to load or cement the pattern better. Now, if somebody already moves well, and you just want to restore motion, here's what I would do. Just flip it. Have her goblet squat first, and then you want to make sure she maintains that motion, have her goblet squat, and then have her do that PVC reaching squat in between sets to restore the motion and make sure she's not losing motion. All right, so this would work really well in the case of, let's say somebody's back squatting. Because when you back squat, you know, you're pinching off the upper back, you're in a really propulsive type position. So what you don't want to do is over time get so propulsive that you end up losing squat depth or you end up beating up your back or your knees. So maybe you would do a set of back squats and then you would use that PVC reaching squat in between to restore motion in between sets. So you make sure every set of squats that you do is nice and crispy. So hopefully that makes sense. Two more, and these are arguably two of my favorites. As you can tell, I, I love talking about uh, these more neurological type supersets. So this one is all about potentiation. And if you work with Gen Pop, maybe not as specific to you, uh, but maybe it is, because if you have some higher level Gen Pop clients, you want to continue to challenge them and find ways to make their, their, their training fun and engaging. But if you train athletes, this one's a game changer. So why would you use potentiation supersets? And the goal here is very simple. We want to stimulate or desensitize the nervous system to improve force or power output. All strength training is, is slowly desensitizing your nervous system to threat. So the first time you squatted, I mean, I remember the first time I squatted heavy, it was maybe like 185, right? That is a massive threat to my system. So at a certain point, my body's gonna say no mas, and it's gonna shut down because it's gonna try and protect itself. Over time, as I loaded, as I progressively got stronger, I desensitized my nervous system. I allowed it to get closer to its true potential. That's all this is. You're trying to desensitize your nervous system or the nervous system of your clients and athletes to help them get even more power or force production out of their bodies. So a handful of examples here, and then I've got some really cool videos for you. When we talk about potentiation, a lot of times I'm thinking uh, a big bang compound exercise. So we're gonna squat something that's a little bit more strength or force based 
and then something that's more speed or power based in between. So we'd squat and then we do a box jump. Maybe we do a deadlift and then we do a broad jump. If we're doing upper body, maybe we do a bench press and then we'd have the client lay on their back, we'd drop a med ball on them and they're gonna reactively throw that med ball um, back up to the sky. So there's all kinds of cool ways you can do this. And you guys know I love videos, I love highlighting my athletes and I don't know why it's making me do this every time, but here's Glenn Robinson, pretty powerful, explosive dude. So what he's gonna do, he's gonna trap our deadlift and you can see I let him squat this a little bit more with a lot of my basketball guys, they don't hinge particularly well. Um, so what I do, I just elevate it a little bit and if this guy's gonna squat it a little bit, he felt frisky that day, hey man, squat it, crank out some heavy weight here. I forget how much this was. I mean, this wasn't heavy for him, it was like 290. Maybe the next set we went to 330, so not hard at all for him. And then we're gonna go and we're gonna do something explosive. Now that's pretty cool, right? I mean, that's that's effortless for him. It's a 36 inch box. He's just gonna drop step and go. All right, so there's one example. Do something heavy, go in, and then immediately do something power or explosive base afterwards. Now, this is what's funny. So you've seen Glenn. Now here is his little brother, Jelen. Jelen just happens to be 6'2", 300 pounds, and plays defensive tackle in the XFL. So in this case, the sport demands for football are very horizontal focused. So I put a lot of emphasis on the horizontal based exercise for him. We still squat, as you'll see here in a minute, but in this case, we're gonna trap bar deadlift, and this dude's a horse. I mean, he trap bars 600 pounds like it's nobody's business. So he's gonna do that, and then we're gonna go out in the gym, or excuse me, out in the uh, alley, and we're gonna do a tire flip, all right? So this is a little bit more load or a little bit more force focused for him. Then we're gonna finish off, and I'll show you a third way that, that we did this. In this case, we did a squat, and in this case it was a band assisted squat paired with a band assisted jump. I need a drink here. So this was towards the end of his off season and the goal was to make him as explosive as we possibly could. I wanted him to feel fast, strong, and explosive going into camp. So we do a set of that, <coughs> excuse me, and then we do a set of these band assisted jumps. And I mean, this guy can jump on that 36 inch box just like his brother. It's just a little bit different strategy. It's a little bit more muscular versus a little bit more tendon based jumping. So when it comes to our potentiation application, how do we set this up? One thing that I would ask you to consider is do you want to develop more force or do you want to develop more power? So in the case of say Jelen, when we're going heavier weights and then a heavier resistance, we're focused more on force. And a lot of times I'll do that more in like the middle of the off season. So we're going to push some weight, we're going to get them strong. There's still a speed element to it, and then we're gonna contrast it with something that's still heavy, but more explosive. Versus when they're getting ready to go to camp, we're gonna do something that's very power focused. So that's where we're gonna do band assisted squatting, band assisted jumping. I want them to feel super bouncy, super explosive. So when they go in, they're just ready to smash people. All right, so you gotta ask yourself that. The second thing I would say is, when you're doing this kind of stuff, I think it's very important to keep it vector specific. And what I mean by that is, if you're going to do a hinge in the gym, like a deadlift variation, you wanna do a hinge variation when you're doing something explosive. So if you don't have access to a tower, maybe, or to a tire, sorry, you would do like a trap bar deadlift, and then you'd superset that with a broad jump. If you're doing a squat, you would superset that with a box jump, something that's more vertical in nature. So try and keep it vector specific, because I think you're gonna get better carryover and a better bang for your buck. All right, so lots of fun stuff there. If nothing else, try some of that. Your, your athletes are absolutely gonna love it. And then last but not least, we have what I call movement layering. And again, full disclosure here. Whoa, excuse me. These may not look uh, like a pure superset because it's not, right? But I think the theme and the way you set this up can be very, very powerful in helping your athletes move in a more fluid, and in a more athletic fashion. So why would we do this? 
And I think the outcome here is very simple. We want to improve movement skill in athletic and or multi-directional movements. So in the gym, there's generally one or two things that you need to clean up to squat better or to hinge better. When it comes to multi-directional movement, there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of things that you may need to work in to help your clients and athletes move more effectively. Now, I'm gonna apologize because there are a lot of videos in a very small space here. But what I want you to see is we basically work from part to whole. And you don't have to do this forever, but I like some of this stuff early on when I'm trying to give my athletes uh, a lot of different pieces of the puzzle and then trying at the end to start bringing those pieces together. Because I don't have guys as long as you might think. In a best case scenario, I got a guy 12 weeks. In a certain case, like uh, my guy Kyrie here, I only had Kyrie for a week. So I wanted to give him a lot of exposures. I wanted to give him a lot of different positions so that he would understand what I wanted him to do when he went home, all right? So in this case, the progression was, we started with a band hip turn. I wanna teach this guy, how do you load your hips? How do you turn effectively versus pivoting, which is a common thing in basketball. So how do you hip turn effectively? Once you have that base position down, how do you take that and add certain levels of momentum to it and speed to it? And then at the end, how do we bring it all together and make it reactive. So in this case, what we do, we do our band hip turn, and all he's doing, he's doing a hip turn, and then he's pushing off that outside leg. So hip turn, push off his left leg. Pretty simple exercise, right? And we have very low momentum. This is the only thing he has to work on right here. Hip turn, push. Hip turn, push. Now, once he's got that down, now, okay, let's layer in a little bit of movement to it, a little bit of momentum, right? Some footwork coordination. So now he's gonna shuffle and he's gonna turn. Shuffle, hip turn, push. You see those same angles, those same positions, hip turn, push. Come back, hip turn, push. Now, this dude's a stud athlete too. This was like two days in, he had already started to clean this up. Now the final piece is, hey, let's make it reactive. Let's make it game speed. And again, I'm just pointing here we could, over the course of the offseason, get it to where he's doing this live against uh, a fellow athlete, and he's on defense. But for demonstrated purposes, I'm going to point, he hip turns, and he goes. All right? So line him up, hip turn, and go. Now, give you uh, another example here. Here's one if we're training more pure side-to-side, -side, uh, like pure lateral acceleration and deceleration. So what we did here, again, kind of a three-pronged approach. In this case, Keelan is doing a fake throw. So shuffle, stick, shuffle, stick. And you can see the difference. Here's Dakota. This day, he was really struggling with this. So I'm gonna let you watch that one more time here. So the goal is to be stiff, stick, stick, stick. There you go. Then we're gonna add in uh, an element of stick, push, stick, push, stick, push, all right? And then we culminate it with a defensive slide. Now they're gonna go up against each other and we're gonna go three to five seconds, very short window of time, but hey man. Sorry. How do you stop, push, shake? You know, you're adding in all these elements of reactivity to it. So you can see why I get so excited about this. If you work with athletes and athletes need to be able to move in multiple directions, so whether it's soccer, whether it's basketball, tennis, um, football, all of these sports, you need that ability to change directions very quickly. And these movement layering options can allow you to cover a lot of ground, teach a lot of skill in a very short period of time. Sorry. Now, here's how I set it up. So in case that wasn't clear, a lot of times your first exercise teaches them a specific position, or perhaps it teaches them a foundational piece of the movement pattern. So if you remember Kyrie, all it was was a hip turn, hip turn and a push, very low level, one thing to focus on. The second exercise layers in an element of controlled speed or momentum, all right? It's not full tilt, you're just teaching them how should it look? How should it feel, right? You're just trying to build on the elements that you just gave them in that first exercise. 
And then the final piece either adds even more speed or momentum to the equation, or it makes it live and it makes it reactive. And sometimes athletes are ready for that. Maybe they're not on day one, but I think the sooner you can make, the, make it reactive and make it competitive, the better it's going to be. And this is something that Lee Tap has you know, just kind of beaten into my head over the year because I used to be big on the skills and the drills and teaching them how to move, but we never got to as much of the reactive competitive stuff. Now I try and get them there as quickly as possible. And as soon as they're ready to go, I'm starting to layer that in. All right, my friend, that kind of wraps this up. So in summary, supersets can help you in so many ways. They can help you as far as saving time, which is arguably the biggest benefit to using them. They can give you certain physiological outcomes, especially when you're thinking about, um, you know, pairing your upper body and lower body exercises to get that central response, to increase the overall density of the workout, but giving each individual muscle group longer to recover. All kinds of great ways you can use it with regards to physiology, but I think the real money and the real magic is these neurological and these movement-based benefits. You just can do so many great things when it comes to using supersets in your programs. And look, I'll just be honest here, I'm all for aesthetics. If you want to just crush aesthetics and make your body as big and strong and beautiful as possible, go for it. But at the end of the day, I'm all for that as long as we're chasing movement as well. I want somebody that looks great, but that moves great as well. And that's where, you know, that second four, those sexy neurological type supersets, man, they can make such a positive impact on how your clients move and feel. But the bottom line is, if you're writing programs, supersets probably can find a place in your programs somewhere. If nothing else, if it just speeds up the amount of time it takes a client or athlete or yourself to get through a workout, that in and of itself is a huge win. So my friend, last but not least, if you're seeing this, you've either already bought Complete Coach or you're on the insiders list, by all means, if you haven't picked this up, it is an absolute game changer of a product. Not only do you get all of the great material that I launched the first time around, the functional anatomy, the coaching and cueing, the program design tips, uh, the progressions, regressions, exercise library. Not only do you get all that, but you're getting an additional nine hour workshop that I shot just about a month ago where we take a deep dive into all the different movement patterns, squatting, hinging, uh, split stance and single leg, reaching, pressing, pulling, hammies, abs. We take all that we give a debrief as to what's important, what you need to be focusing on, and then we go in the gym and I'm coaching all kinds of different people, different shapes, different sizes, because at the end of the day, you can watch E move all you want and he looks great, but I think it's really valuable to see how somebody coaches people of different shapes, different sizes, and different abilities. So it's all dropping March 2nd. Save yourself 200 bucks. This is by far the cheapest it's gonna be because when I relaunch in September, that price is getting jacked up. I'm only gonna be adding more stuff and it's only going to be getting better the longer I keep it out there. So my friend, again, thank you so much for tuning in. I really hope you got a lot. <laughs> I really hope you got a lot out of it. And if you have any questions at all, please let me know, uh, whether it's social media, whether it's email, whether it's on the website, any questions you have, let me know and I'll do my best to answer.